to Zero to Hero, become an AI Profilet Mentorship. We are thrilled to have you on board as we embark on this exciting eight-week journey to unlock the true potential of AI. Throughout this program, you will gain hands-on experience and in-depth knowledge integrating Microsoft Copilots seamlessly into your workflow to boost work quality and efficiency. By the end of this mentorship, you will be equipped with cutting-edge AI tools to boost your productivity and innovation. We are excited to see how you use these tools to transform your daily work, and we are excited to prepare you for the future, a future with AI. Join us. Already, okay, let's transition to the, the reason why we are here, that all of us are here today, is to hear from the one and only April Dunham. April Dunham is a fellow MVP. She was an MVP for multiple years. She's now, I have written the title because I don't wanna, I don't wanna give you a title that's less than, than it's deserving. She's the principal cloud ad, uh, advocate for the CAT team with Microsoft. If you don't know uh, April and you are working with Power Platform or Dynamics 365 SharePoint, I'm not sure how you have missed her, but she is a star. Uh, and the beauty of this community is that uh, everybody, even the ones that are well known in the community, they are always willing to collaborate, to donate time and, and provide their knowledge to us. And we are super grateful, April, uh for your contribution to our program and we are excited to have you here today so the floor is yours my friend take it away thanks so much for that wonderful introduction happy to be here to kick yeah. off this training on becoming an ai pro pilot so lots of great speakers for the remainder of these sessions so just honored to be amongst all these wonderful speakers here to kick things off. So what I'm going to be talking about today is an introduction to understanding AI fundamentals. So this should give you the background that you need to be able to have a good understanding of just the basics of AI so that all the other sessions will really fall into place. Um, a little bit of what we're going to cover. I'm going to talk about what is AI. We'll cover the layers of AI, talk about some common tools used, and uh, go into prompting and then uses of AI in the Power Platform, just touching on that at a very high level. Uh, for those who don't know me, I know Victor gave a great introduction, but I am a Power Platform advocate at Microsoft. Uh, work along a lot of gr other great advocates like Scott, who's on the call. Um, I am a former MVP. I'm a YouTuber. I'm a cat lady. Um, those are the ways that you can connect with me after the session. Um, if you have any questions we don't get to or anything else that comes along the way. Okay, so let's get started. So I am describing AI as kind of layers of an onion. So there's a lot behind the scenes that we need to unpack and different layers that we need to peel. So AI itself is really the outside of the onion and there's lots of stuff within it that encapsulates it. So we're gonna peel back all of these different layers here, starting with AI. So we've all heard of AI, I'm sure. So it's really just a software that imitates human behaviors and capabilities, and um, it helps, it can perceive its environment and mimic different cognitive functions. So there's all kinds of different artificial intelligence capabilities out there. We've all seen the movies, we've seen Terminator, we know, like just from, from that alone, what AI is. Uh, AI, though, is, is nothing new. It's been around for a long time, um, and um, we've seen it evolve and evolve over the years. So probably the thing that we're all really cognizant of now that's in the news and all the capabilities is something called generative AI, which we'll get to. Um, but, you know, it goes all the way back to the 50s with the Turing test. Um, you know, IBM had um, the Deep Blues, like it was able to beat a world champion in chess that was in the, the late 90s there. Um, you know, Surrey, that's an AI tool um, when that came about in the iPhone um, and all that. And IBM Watson, of course, that we all we've heard of as well, uh, beating Jeopardy contestants. So these are all pop culture kind of uses of AI that we've seen over the years here. 
So that's AI in itself. But if we kind of trying to get our way into how is this applicable today in our modern world with all of the Microsoft products that we're going to be using and learning about throughout the course of this training. Well, if we go back uh, another layer and peel back another layer of this onion, then we have machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence that enables machines to be able to learn from existing data and improve upon that data to be able to make predictions and decisions. So this is trained on a vast variety of data sets um, for search algorithms and um, being, being able to have more capable and sophisticated systems. So what's a real world example of machine learning that you're probably using every day and don't even realize it? Well, email spam filtering is an example. So all email providers have a machine learning algorithm behind the scenes that analyzes different patterns in your email. So it looks for keywords, um, frequencies, sender reputation, all those type of things. And it classifies your emails as spam or important or whatever kind of variables that we have there. So that is a a modern day kind of thing that we use all the time. That's an example of machine learning in use. So if we dive into machine learning and go a layer deeper, we have something called deep learning. So this is a specific machine learning technique that uh, in which layers of neural networks are used to process data and make decisions. So an example of this, so this is based off of machine learning. It's just a kind of subset of that um, specifically for, you know, using those neural networks. So something you use every day probably for this is facial recognition. So anytime you open up your iPhone or your mobile device and you use face ID to log in, that is using deep learning to make that happen. So it has algorithms behind the scenes that is analyzing your facial features and it's comparing those to stored data and it's um, identifying any changes. So it can detect the smallest things like you're wearing glasses, you have a hat on today, maybe you change your hair color, things like that. It's all trained um, with these different learning algorithms to be able to handle those changes. So now we're getting to what we're probably all here for and what we'll be focusing on for the remainder of these sessions, and that's generative AI. So this is a subset. It's, a, it's an AI concept. It uses machine learning and deep learning models um, to be able to create new visual auditory uh, and content using prompts and data. So this generative AI in itself is kind of a blanket term, like AI is a blanket term. So AI covers all of these different capabilities and possibilities, whereas generative AI covers any capability that can generatively create some type of content for us. So what are some examples of this and types of, you might hear it referred to as Gen AI for short, instead of generative. Uh, well, text-based generative AI use cases like ChatGPT, if we've heard of that. Um, so those are good for chatbots and content creation. We have image-based generative AI capabilities like Dolly and Midjourney to be able, you can use those for design and art and media use cases. We even have generative AI capabilities for audio and music. Um, so there's like MuseNet and stuff. I use some of those. I, I do music on the side and I've experimented with some of these for music generation and then video generation, uh, generative AI capabilities as well with things like um, synesthesia. Now generative AI is pretty interesting because it is the fastest growing tool uh, over the years. So we can see um, the time to reach 100 million users. So if you take a look at the mobile phone, right? So we think, think of the iPhone when that was released and um, you know back to the flip phone days, it took 16 years for mobile phones to reach 100 million users. It took the internet seven years to get to that point. Um, Facebook took 4.5 years, but think of things like ChatGPT, which are generative AI tools, it took three months. So it just kind of shows the scale <laughs> of how many people are using this and honestly how life-changing, game-changing this generative technology is. Just the sheer volume of people using this compared to all of these things we use every day too and how long that they took to get to the same point. So it is an extremely fast growing user base and we're seeing this all over the place in the tools that we use day to day. So what are some of the things that this generative AI capability can do for us? Well, we, we mentioned content generation and we talked about images and videos and all that, but it can also do code generation 
generation. So you might have heard of GitHub Copilot. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But it can help us write code, images. It can do all kinds of things like summarizing text. So an example of this could be you start with a prompt. And I'll get into some details of just some few ins and outs of prompting. So every way that we interact with these generative AI capabilities is through a conversation. So we have to put in a prompt, which is some text. And then that helps us get information out of these different tools. So we could ask it to write a tagline for an ice cream shop, and it could give a response. So we could have it uh, help write code, like we want to write a SQL query and um, images. So, so many different things we can do. So generative AI is kind of that blanket term for all of these different capabilities. But then we have something called an LLM, which stands for a large language model. So these are specific AI models designed to process and generate the human-like languages. So they're trained on a ton of data across the internet and um, all kinds of data um, to be able to understand this human language. So uh, these are you know, a generative AI capability that we have um, to be able to do that. So you might also hear something called a small language model. So those are kind of like LLMs, except they're for more simpler use cases, uh, more limited focus use cases. So they're trained on smaller data sets and are for really specific tasks. Like think um, if you have a smart thermostat, like being able to set the temperature um, on your smart thermostat and all that kind of learning. That would be an example of more of a small language model approach where a large language model are trained to handle everything from helping you write code to helping you write a poem or a song. Now, within an LLM, you have something called GPT, which is a generative pre-trained transformer. So this is a specific type of large language model that's developed by OpenAI. So anytime you see GPT, that's what we're talking about here. And with GPT, there are all different kinds of versions of generative pre-trained transformers uh, that we use. So we have all different types of instances of large language models, which I'll touch on here. But GPT is probably the most common large language model that you've heard of and that you interact with all the time if you're already using some of this capability. A little bit more about large language models as a whole. They're based on neural networks and they do use that natural language to interact. So we got to put some language in and then we get something out. Um, so they understand many different spoken languages and how it works is it just predicts the next word in a sequence of words. So I, um, I didn't get to go to Scottish Summit this year, but I caught Scott Hanselman's keynotes on that. Um, so he explained this really well. It's kind of like um, celebrity uh, celebrity feud, I think, or, you know, you know, um, you poll the audience and then you have to kind of answer like, you know, what's the most um, cutest animal? And then you just poll a random amount of people and based off of the data that they have, um, they guess what they think the top five cutest animals are, right? So that's kind of essentially what a large language model is doing is if you put in something, it's just kind of guessing based off of the data that it has, what is the next best word in that sequence? Um, another thing is they're non-deterministic, and this is just a fancy word for saying that the output that you get is random. So if I put in the exact same prompt into a large language model one time, I, and I could get one answer, and then I do that prompt again, and I could get a totally different answer. So it's a completely random output, and you really can't control what that output is going to be. Now, some of the um, advances, this is technology that is changing extremely rapidly. So we've had several different models of GPT, for example, which is OpenAI's large language model over the past few years. And some of the new capabilities that are showing up is the ability to be multimodal. So this means it supports multiple modalities. So it can not only understand text and return text to you, but it can understand voice, video, and images. So you could upload an image of something and have it understand what's going on in that image and explain that. Same thing with video. And you can have back and forth conversations via voice as well. And there's all kinds of use cases in different large language models out there. Um, as you can tell, like OpenAI isn't the only player in the game. Obviously, Microsoft has some, uh, Google, um, you got the Gemini and all that. And then you might have seen um, I think, I can't remember exactly who was it in the um, MVP community, but they're using the new Google model where it can actually create a podcast for you. 
So there's all kinds of capabilities where it can have a two person, it can take any text that you put into it and it can create a two person kind of podcast explaining your topic. So there's all kinds of different, you know, large language models for language translation, uh, classification and text generation and kind of just showing the, the main players in the game um, so far and kind of the, the tooling and stuff that you can do with that. So speaking of tooling, so we have large language models and we have GPT, uh, which is OpenAI's kind of implementation of a large language model. So what are some commonly used GPT tools? So we have the models themselves, but we need basically an interface, an application to be able to interact with these different models. So that's what some of these common tools are. So if you've heard of chat GPT, that is itself is just an interface to work with the GPT models here. So it's just a general purpose conversational interface that you have where you can go and have that human-like interaction, ask questions, ask for assistance, and it returns the information to you. So that's just an interface built for you to interact with those GPT models. I mentioned GitHub Copilot earlier. That is another example of a GPT tool and interface that uses a different model called Codex to assist specifically with code generation. So this is an LLM trained specifically on all the different like coding capabilities. So it's tailored for developers. It can understand different languages like uh, JavaScript or C Sharp and all that. And it can help with syntax, logic, explaining, can even help with documentation. And that's what it's trained for. But like these models are tuned for that. So if you try to ask it random stuff like, um, how much does an elephant weigh? It's, you're going to get a message that it can't help you with that because it's only trained in, to help you with um, coding tasks. And then you have things like Copilot, which we'll talk a little bit more about here in a minute. Those are more like productivity assistant, GPT-based um, models here that our main purpose is to enhance your productivity through existing tools like Word, Excel, and Teams and all of that. So when we go into the Microsoft ecosystem and we talk about how does this all fit in with the Microsoft tools we're using, well, they have a partnership with OpenAI so that they're using these GPT models that OpenAI creates to augment that and extend and have tooling throughout the Microsoft ecosystem to help us. So it's using like GPT-4, GPT-4.0, which are specific GPT models, um, ChatGPT for conversation, Codex for the code generation, and Dolly for image generation. So that's where we get the term Copilot. So if you're wondering where Copilot fits into this, that is a AI assistant that uses generative AI and large language models to assist us with various tasks, whether it's creating a new PowerPoint presentation, um, you know, helping write a performance review based off of data from our team's chat history, um, writing a new Power App, things like that. It's all integrated. So we're starting to see Copilot have these more generative AI experiences help us throughout all of the different Microsoft products, whether it's within uh, Microsoft 365, Power Platform, Dynamics, Windows. There are actually over 115 Copilot experiences throughout the Microsoft ecosystem right now. So um, all over the place, we have these generative AI based experiences to be able to help us, um, you know, write, write Word documents faster and you name it. And we're starting to see an evolution too with the co-pilot experience that we have. So again, these are all uh, GPT-based large language models. And so we're kind of traditionally, it's been more focused on personal productivity. So helping us with, you know, getting answers, brainstorming, you know, generating images and all those kind of things that we need for a daily job. And then it's kind of evolved to more like a, how can it help groups of people? And then it's even evolving more to how it can help us more from a process standpoint and kind of more automate things, which I'll touch on here in a minute. But just to level set, like what, what are the key co-pilot functionalities that we have? So, um, cause it can get confusing cause there's so many different co-pilot experiences. So I wanted to touch on this briefly. Uh, Microsoft Copilot. So in the past, you might have heard this referred to as Bing Chat. So this was actually uh, announced back in February 2023. Um, but now it is called Microsoft Copilot. So this is basically like Microsoft's Chat GPT interface. So um, maybe right now would be a good opportunity to kind of show just some of these capabilities and what I'm talking about and how we interface with these models. So right now I'm in ChatGPT. Anyone can access ChatGPT for free. There is a free version here. So just go to chatgpt.com and you can start interfacing with this. So as I mentioned, this is just that um, kind of application layer where we can connect with these different models. 
So one of the things I mentioned as well is with these generative pre-trained transformers, we have different models. So just basically different versions of uh, the models that we can work with. So the one that is default right now is called GPT-4.0. This is that, when I mentioned multimodal, this gives us that multimodal capability. So I could upload an image and ask it information about that. I could have it create images and different things for me and have that, um, or a chat-based experience even. There's a co-pilot um, or chat GPT app that you can download on your phone and just use your microphone only to have a back and forth conversation as well and ask it all kinds of questions too. So that's what the O model does. Um, there's also a new Canvas, which is in beta. So that's really good for you know, writing code. And it kind of explains what each of these models do. So there's one kind of geared more towards advanced reasoning, like if you're wanting to solve like math problems and things like that, you can switch the model that you're using based off of what you need to do and what you're trying to do um, with generative AI. And these kind of show you some of the examples um, that we can use this for as far as, you know, creating images, brainstorming. Um, but, you know, I, you can just ask it anything you want. Like, I want help brainstorming a session on explaining the fundamentals uh, of AI. And it doesn't even matter if you misspell stuff because it's able to um, extract all that out. So I kind of misspelled a few things there, but it's fine. So now it's just in real time, kind of giving me an answer and helping me kind of brainstorm. What might I want to talk about in this session here? You know, so what is AI? What are the key components? Might want to explain large language models. Um, see, so you, you don't even need me because we can just go, go to ChatGPT and have it um, give you all the basics of, of AI right here. Um, but this is just one thing that, that we can use it uh, with here. But I mentioned it can be like multimodal, so I can say create an image that depicts what AI is. So it can do all kinds of different things for us. So now it's going and using this LLM to create an image based off of what I put in. And it has, um, I guess, what's called memories as well. So as you connect and you work and you talk with these different uh, GPT models here is keeping track of what you talked about and is able to have that recall so you can use it in um, future conversations. So here's a nice image that I created that kind of shows AI. So I can copy and use that, use this all the time. Um, you can even do things like, so this is some newer functionality that was added that I think is pretty cool. So if there's certain elements that you don't want, so maybe that's kind of weird because it's spelled weird in this. I can just shade those and I can say remove these parts and keep tweaking the image too. So this is part of that um, GPT-40 capability, the newer capability to modify the image. And it's gonna give me a modified version of this. So this is something that if you aren't already should probably be part of your like day-to-day -day, um, operations. I, I don't think there's a day that I go without using some kind of you know, ChatGPT or Copilot type experience. So now I can see there's a modified version with those two pieces gone. So just a quick example of kind of what we can do with some of the image capabilities within here too. Um, and, and as I mentioned, it can kind of have that knowledge of you. So this is basically OpenAI's implementation of how to interface with its GPT models. Copilot is Microsoft's implementation of that. And again, the benefits that you're getting from this is there's a web version and there's also a work version of this. So, you know, with the work version, when you're talking with this, it's going to have context of all of your work data. So it's going to be able to go through your emails, through your team's messages, files that you have access to, and use that as knowledge essentially to inform its answers rather than just publicly available data on the web. So, you know, with the web portion that I have selected here, it's going to be very similar to GPT. It uses the GPT 4.0 model, and I can have it answer questions, um, you know, like what are five to six ways to beat procrastination? I know I struggle with that, so this might be good to know. And it can give me some quick answers here. Uh, one thing that it does that um, you don't always see with ChatGPT is it does cite its sources, so I can go to any of these links. These are clickable and find out where it's getting that information from, from the web. You have a chat history here of the things, the conversations that you've had. And then I can always switch over to work mode. And now this is the same technology, but just having access to my work data. I can ask it specific information about people, files that I have, ask it to summarize 
um, you know, catch up what's what's new in my inbox. These are kind of helper prompts to summarize the last 10 emails um, that I have, which is really cool. So it has all of that context um, that I have here to be able to get these quick summaries. So that's that's one implementation, and this is um, Microsoft 365 Copilot. So one of the things that this is doing, just to go back to the slides here, is it has all the context. So it's a large language model. So it's like having the the power of a large language model with the power of Microsoft Graph, which is where all of your data is stored in the Microsoft ecosystem, plus all the power of Microsoft 365 apps and the internet. So it's really a supercharged um, co-pilot um, chat GPT type interface that we have here to have all of that context and awareness. Now, so far we talked about you know, how do we interface with different large language models and GPT and all that through some of these out of the box tools. And I know in the next session, I think Victor talks about how you can use Copilot for all of your office documents and all that. So Word, PowerPoint, Excel. So I won't go into that, but that's another capability that we have. Um, but what if you want to do something like have your own custom Copilot experience? Well, that's another thing that we can do. So rather than just relying on these pre-built interfaces and models that we have um, that just go and pull out information from the web, what if we wanted to build our own custom one over our specific data? Well, that's what we can do with things like Microsoft Copilot Studio. So that allows us to build our own custom Copilots over our data. So we have all of these Copilot experiences within the products, but the ability to build our own Copilots as well. Now, there's so much terminology I'm throwing at you, so hopefully your head's not completely spinning. But we have a Copilot, uh, which is that kind of bot-based chat, chatbot type experience that we have to be able to interact with these different LLMs. But we also have agent capabilities, which is some new functionality just in the past few weeks that was kind of announced here that we can build with Copilot Studio. So we can have the Copilot-like experience, but also have that in an automated fashion. So rather than always having to have a chat-based conversation with these different LLMs, we can have it add in some power like like we can do in Power Automate, where we can have it every Friday go and get all of our emails and summarize that and add it into a data source and all that. That's what we can do with these agent capabilities. It's kind of adding more of an automation layer to the co-pilot generative AI type experience that we have. So you might hear that word. It's an early access preview. If you're, you know, I'm sure you'll be hearing more about that um, as time goes on and it continues to evolve. So just wanted to kind of let you be aware of that. I'm sure you'll learn more about that in future sessions. So what are some use cases of what you might use or want your own co-pilot type experience? So there's all kinds of use cases from business to consumer, business to business, and business to enterprise. Um, customer support is a really common example of where you might want your own custom Copilot experience. So being able to have a customer support bot that automatically can handle specific customer inquiries, like how many times do you get asked what your store hours are or what your return policy is. You can just create a Copilot that has access to where that data is stored and users can be able to just have a chat interface and get those questions answered. Um, same thing with product support, you know, being able to find out product information from a business to business um, perspective, like a lead qualification type co-pilot um, would be a good example, supplier interactions, and then even internal specific use cases for HR, like an onboarding co-pilot so people can know what the onboarding process is, you know, how do I get all my HR benefits and all that kind of stuff. So no shortage of, of use cases there. Now, of course, Power Platform isn't the only way that we can create custom co-pilots and work with generative AI and all that. We also have Azure and Azure AI. There's a whole slew of capabilities within Azure that we can take advantage of from different you know, vision and speech capabilities, um, Azure AI Studio, um, different machine learning capabilities. So we can really kind of no, no limit to what we can do, whether we're using more low code tools like the Power Platform or Azure to be able to build really custom models and capabilities and all of that. So tons of stuff we can do. Um, now, when there's a lot of options, it can be confusing and like when to use what and kind of really narrow down what, what Copilot is experience is right for me. Now, this isn't an end all beat all guide, but just kind of more a decision tree to get you thinking when you might use what specific tool. 
So if you need a co-pilot experience and your first decision point is, do you need to be able to chat with your own data sources or not, right? So if it's just getting information from the general web that you want to have brainstorm or, you know, just general large language models, then Microsoft Copilot is a good fit for that. So that's that kind of chat GPT like experience um, that we have data it can travel out outside of your tenant boundary so you can go out to the, the web and all and take advantage of all of that data. But if you do want to be able to get information based off your own data sources, like, you know, messages that I've interactions I've had in teams or files I have access to, then that's when, as I showed earlier, we can toggle in Microsoft Copilot from web to work, or you might use the work capability in of Microsoft 365 Copilot, which has the power of the graph in Microsoft 365 applications to get that additional context. Now, the other decision point too here is, do you need to be able to build your own interface um, and have a more managed experience with that? And so in, the, in that case, that might be where you wanna build your own copilot. So um, you might wanna have like, really define the data sources that it gets information from. And if someone asks for this particular thing, like how do I submit an expense request? You want them to go through a very specific path. So that might be a custom copilot play. And then you just need to decide, well, do I want full control over everything or do I want to take advantage of some of the out of the box capabilities and just be able to tweak my data sources and actions and all that. So that's kind of a decision between copilot studio or AI studio, or maybe a mixture of both, uh, depending on your use case. So that just hopefully kind of explains um, some of the key differences between, between that. Now, to get the most out of any of these tools that we're using, you really need to know about prompting. So you might have heard of prompt engineering and all that, and that being kind of a real popular um, thing nowadays you need to know. So essentially a prompt, all it is, is instructions that we do send to these different generative AI models so that we can help accomplish a task. So this is, no matter what tool we're using, we need to put in a prompt to be able to get what we want out of it. Now, just to do a, a high level run through of the different power platform specific experiences where we'll have generative AI capability and we'll need to know how to prompt. Um, we have in Power Apps the ability to create applications with prompts. So we just put in a prompt, like I want an application for um, managing onboarding process and it can go and take that. And there's new things like plan designer that can help you define user roles, your data model, the different applications you would need and things like that. We have it in Power Apps as well for Power FX. So it can help us write Power FX code, explain what's going on in Power FX, which is really cool. We have it in Power Apps from an end user perspective. So we can actually integrate a Copilot into the apps that we're building that uh, built in Copilot Studio that can have access to very specific data and that we define. Uh, we also have it in Power Automate where we can do automations uh, using prompts, uh, Power Pages as well, all things from building a page and Power Page to building a custom theme and um, tweaking the data that's on our page with Copilot. And there's even generative building capabilities in Copilot Studio uh, to help you build a Copilot with Copilot, uh, which is like Copilot <laughs> Inception. And then we have things even outside the scope of Copilot, like AI Builder. So AI Builder has its own model that lets you interface with GPT. So there's a create text with GPT model in AI Builder and anything that we can do with a prompt, basically, we can do with this model. So this is really allowing us to have that power of GPT in our business processes and our applications. So imagine being able when um, to have a, a process that goes through when a certain email is received, like say an invoice you get and it can go and extract data from that invoice and summarize it for you and go put it in a data source automatically just with AI without you having to do anything. So that's an example, you know, summarizing things, extracting tasks um, out of an email, things like that. So how do we make sure that we craft a good prompt? What are some of the basics? Well, I'm going to just walk you through some simple terminology here about how to get good prompts and get the most out of some of these tools. So there's a few terms. One is called zero shot prompting. So this is where you just ask the question. So if we target this and narrow this down to uh, the concept of using this in Power Apps, 
So an example of this would be asking Power Apps to just create an application to manage inspections. So if I went into Power Apps and I put in that very simple prompt, this will use Copilot for Power Apps and it will suggest a table with inspection and inspection detail. So if I look at some of this data, I can see, you know, we have some basic data, inspector name, location, the status, and then the detail, if we look at that data, um, okay, <laughs> inspection, inspection detail. So kind of duplicative, not necessarily what I need, honestly. This is not the best outcome for what I need for my process. So what went wrong? Well, zero shot prompting oftentimes isn't the best approach simply because you're going to have to do a lot of back and forth. Um, it's going to be too vague to really get a good outcome. So what you would want to do is to try something more like few shot prompting, which is just giving it a little bit more relevant information. So for that same concept, for that same need, I could just add a little bit more detail. So I can say add, create an application to manage inspections, but it should handle fire equipment safety inspections for multiple customers and have a checklist in a pass fail status. So if I put this in the same experience in Power Apps Copilot, we're going to get a totally different outcome. And that's because I added some key information that it needed, like what type of inspection. And I put in some qualifiers of the specific things I need. So now I have a table to manage customers. Now I have the actual inspection record table where I can see the key mapping it to the customer and the inspection date and all of that. And then I have the checklist where it goes into the different things that I'll be checking in the inspection and whether it is pass fail. So this is much more in line to what I was needing for the application that I'm building just by adding a little bit of detail. So what I just did there when I went from the zero shot example to the few shot example is I use this formula. So this is a formula that I use quite a bit for my prompting. And this isn't just for Power Apps Copilot. This is for any time that you're interfacing with a generative model. This is the kind of a formula that you can use to write and craft a good prompt. First is to start with the task. So what are you wanting it to do? Um, I want you to help me write a report um, for my boss, right? That's the task. Then you're going to give the context. Um, I am a sales manager and I need to write a report about our current sales estimates, right? So that's a little bit more context. Then you're going to set the expectations. You know, this needs to show our top customers for the month, you know, whatever those key details are. And then the output. So you can, um, depending on what tool you're using, specify the output of how you want this. Like I want this to be formatted in a short, easy to use format for a sales manager who just wants the, you know, TLDR version, something like that. Or you can even customize if you want the output in like bullet point format, um, you want it to be in JSON. There's so many capabilities there. But if you follow this formula, you're going to be pretty set no matter what generative tool you're using. So how could we use this, say, in AI Builder? So let's take a look at a prompt that we might write. We're going to start with the task, ask it to create a product feedback summary. The context we're giving it is based off of recent customer reviews. And here you can dynamically pass in some content. So that's what this reviews um, piece is showing is I'm going to dynamically pull in some information there. Then we're going to set the expectation. The summary should identify key themes, overall sentiment, and any recurring issues or praises. And now I'm just going to put in the output. So format this to be concise and present the information in a clear, easy to understand manner, suitable for a marketing team meeting. All right. So with all that context, we're going to use AI Builder in that create text with GPT model to build this out and see what kind of output we're getting. So this is using OpenAI's GPT model. Uh, same thing that we saw when we went to chatgpt.com. The interface for interacting with it here is just different. So I'm going to pass in right here. So I'm just creating an input property, and I can put in some sample data. So I have some customer reviews here that are um, ranging from positive to negative, and I'm going to just run this and test out my prompt based off. So I fed in some sample data of customer reviews, and now here is the output that I get. So this is using that model. You can see exactly what I ask it to do. We have some key themes, we have sentiment, and then we have recurring issues and praises. So that's an example of kind of what we can get with that. Now that is good, and that basic formula will be good for probably 80% of the use cases. But you can tweak that, and this is a, a formula that I use sometimes. It's just slightly expanded, um, just subtly. 
that could potentially get you better results. So you can add into the mix a persona at the start. So you can, I'll give you an example of this in a minute. So rather than just going straight off the bat with the task, you can kind of give it more example of the persona, the context, then go into the task, um, the key expectations, the format, and then a tone. So just slightly tweaked, um, but it does make a difference as we'll look at. So using this exact same use case, this is how I would revise this prompt. I would say you're a senior product marketing manager. So that's the persona that we're adding into the mix. And the context is you have just been tasked with evaluating feedback on your latest product, the Contoso widget. So we didn't have this before, this persona and context. Now we're going to have the same task and the same um, examples here to create the feedback summary, the key themes and all of that. The format, I'm going to have it, um, don't add any additional information, use concise language, and then the tone is new as well. Um, you know, just going to have it in a friendly tone, easy to understand for a marketing team meeting. So we're gonna use this same prompt here, um, the same tool, AI Builder, but just with this revised prompt, we have the exact same reviews as well. So I didn't change anything in the input there. So all the same reviews as we had as last time, but we'll see how the outcome is going to be quite a bit different from the outcome that we had before. And I don't know how closely you looked at the output from the first prompt, but you might see some things have moved because I asked it to kind of um, kind of classify um, the recurring issues and themes and all that. So we'll have this kind of load the response and we'll see like the output just looks better. This is more copy and pasteable. So the other one had all these asterisks kind of everywhere, right? Um, and it was just really simple bullet points. This elaborates a little bit more on some of these key issues. So yeah, here I'll do a side by side really quick so you can kind of see the key differences. So that is the new kind of expanded prompt on the left. And this was that original prompt that we have on the right. So you can see just much, much more human readable and expanded. Um, like information there that I could use and send to my boss. So how you prompt really does matter and the amount of detail you prompt really matters. And another co not commonly known thing too is um, order does matter. So if you change around the order a lot, like if you try to do the output first and the task last, um, you're not gonna get a good result. It's going to be confused because um, LLMs, they are forward reading. So you always wanna kind of start or have at the very early part of the prompt, um, the, the task, which you actually want it to do. And because that's what it's going to kind of pick up on first um, and key in on. And this is just an example of how, you know, order could change the outcome here. So, you know, if you're asking to help create a blog, about meditation. So the first one is kind of how I would recommend with the task first to create the blog, some more information there. And the other one is kind of more of the like, here's the persona and then ending with the task. So kind of how each of those would look if we were to test them out. So this is the task first kind of approach there. And then we'll do the task last, um, completely changing up the order here on the right. So that looks like a pretty well-written blog based off of all the information that I provided there. And yeah, it looks pretty good. And then we'll go over to this prompt here, which again is putting the task last. And then we'll see it's just not, you know, you don't got to read it in and out, but it's just not as as good. And it even says, in this case, um, it's different every time. Again, as I mentioned, um, you know, you'll get different outputs every time, but it wasn't even able to produce um, a good response there. So we kind of got an error message and it just isn't as verbose. So order matters. Okay, let's do a quick terminology break because there's a few things we need to know when we are working with these models. First thing is tokens. Um, I wish I had sound effects queued up because I would totally do the Mario um, <laughs> token sound effect here. Um, but so tokens are important to know about when you're using these models because they are word pieces. So how it works when we put in a prompt, the AI is going to break out that prompt into chunks, which they call and refer to as tokens. Now, these aren't just a strict like character count situation when you put in text. These uh, tokens can be either complete words or they can just be parts of words. So each tool that you use can have its own different, what's called a token limit. So basically how much text you can put in and how much text you can get out 
of those different models. Um, so you'll have to kind of look and know, like whatever, depending on the tool you're using, what those token limits are. Um, for example, I think a lot of the um, Power Platform Copilot capability is 4,000 tokens. And so it is a little hard to know, well, exactly how much can I put in since it does handle and it kind of do does the chunks of words. So all of that to say is you need to be as thorough as possible and providing, you know, using that formula and providing the necessary detail, but as succinct as possible because then you'll risk running into these token limits. Um, so the longer the text, the more tokens, and then you can run into issues because it won't evaluate everything that you have or have a shorter response than you're expecting. Uh, the other thing to be aware of that you might have heard is hallucinations. This isn't what you get after, you know, eating some bad mushrooms. This is more, um, you know, how AI can kind of make up stuff um, and can have incorrect or fabricated answers. So when a model, um, this is generally more of a problem. This is why prompting is so important when your prompts are unclear or too broad. So that zero shot prompting example that I showed earlier, that is more likely to produce hallucinations like false inaccurate information than the few shot prompting where I put in some additional information. So all that to say, you know, putting a, a better prompt together, like a more thorough prompt is going to help against this, but always check, you know, what the fact check all the responses that you get out of any of these tools. Um, when it comes to Power Platform, you know, this formula, you may, it may change based off the tool you're using. So for the AI builder situations that we've looked at where we had it summarize some text, you know, the, this expanded formula is really great for that, but that's going to be overkill for Power Automate. So Power Automate, the nature of the beast there is it's a workflow automation tool. So we're going to need to have a different formula where we start with, well, when should this happen? Then we're gonna need to go in with the task and then we can go with the format. So there's all these different um, types of, of formulas that you'll need depending on the tool you're using. Key things to know about Power Automate Copilot, make sure that you use the exact names of the services that you want it to use to get a good result. So if you put in a vague prompt like, go get my task and send them in an email, it's, it's not gonna work for you. But if you say, go get my task from Microsoft Planner and send them in an email through the Outlook connector, then it will know what you're talking about and be able to get you a suggestion for a flow. So just something to keep in mind with. So this is an example of what a good prompt for Power Automate Copilot would be at the end of every week. That's when. Send me a summary of my pending task and planner. That's the task with the, the name of the action that we want to use. And then the format. Uh, format it in bullet point with task name, status, and due date in a Microsoft Teams message. So let's just kind of take a really quick look at what this will look like in Power Automate. So there's my prompt that I've used my formula with. And we'll go to generate. And now it's got everything I need. So we got a recurrence trigger because I want this to run at the end of every week. It's got planner, which is great. It's going to post the message to Teams, all the stuff I want. And it even has the weekly capability there that I want in the recurrence. And it's getting all the details I need. So it's just an example of how a, a prompt matters when it comes to Power Automate. Same thing with Copilot Studio. Um, it doesn't need a win, but you will want to start with the task, context, and expectation. So it's just um, a simplified version, basically, of our basic prompt formula where we're not specifying um, the output because the output's going to be a copilot. Um, so, like, let a user check the status of a flight, anticipating the flight number and date. For each question, add two variations and a speech alternative. So, that would be a good example of a prompt there. Now, just a few more things when we're talking about prompting. Um, these really apply to AI Builder. So hopefully you all can go try AI Builder and see some of the great capability that's in there. Um, but the models, as I mentioned, so with um, ChatGPT, I, I click on that dropdown. There are all those like 4.0 and um, you know Mini and all those different models. Uh, in AI Builder, we can choose either the GPT 3.5 or GPT 4.0 model. So you can specify which model to use there. Generally, um, probably 4.0 if you're wanting to do some of that um, advanced capability is best. Um, speaking of those token limits, you'll notice that I have those written out here. 3.5 um, as 16,000 tokens, but 4.0 allows up to 128,000 tokens. So what does that mean? That means you can get more robust responses and longer responses from the 4.0 model that you can use. Um, so an example of how different these models can look 
So for this example, I'm going to ask it to classify feedback. So pay attention here. We have two positive, one neutral, and two negative feedbacks using the 3 phi model. I'm switching this right now to the 4 model. And we'll see what we get here in this classification. Now it's changed to one positive, two neutral, and two negative. So this is showing how much better the 4-0 model is than the 3-5 model at these type of classification scenarios. So it picked up on the fact that this one, um, you see that, that neutral feedback, the widgets are fantastic, but there's a however, only one complaint is shipping time. So the 3-5 model is like, oh, I see that it's fantastic, so that has to be positive. The 4-0 model is able to take take more of the context and realize, well, there's a shipping time issue as well. So I'm going to classify that as neutral. So 4.0 is generally a better model to use for these cases. Other thing, uh, kind of last big terminology thing to keep in mind of is temperature. So this just controls the randomness of the response. So as we mentioned, all of the responses here are random. Um, so we can't really control, you know, from one um, instance of it to the next, what exactly it gives us, but we can control things and kind of help limit some hallucinations and things like that by adjusting the temperature. So that just, um, the higher the temperature, the more creative and varied the responses, the lower the temperature, the more focused and predictable. So this really just comes down to creativity versus accuracy. So for your specific prompt, if you're wanting to help it brainstorm ideas, um, help you write a, a novel, that would be something where you would slide that temperature thing maybe a little higher so it can be a little bit more fun and creative. If you're wanting to use it for like a business task, like class the classification scenario that we just use for feedback, well, you'll want that to be on the lower end so that it's more factual in its answers. And we're in the home stretch here. Um, just know your output. So with AI Builder, we can have the classic text output, but we can also output data as JSON. So if we take this same feedback classification, if I wanted to be able to, instead of just emailing this data, like maybe add this into a database, having that in a JSON format might be really beneficial. So just by toggling that to JSON, now we're going to have that in an easy to read format um, so i can go parse this say in power automate and have that add this to a database for me easily by changing the output so that is a capability that we have uh, we also have the concept of something called grounding so it's not giving you know not putting your ai in trouble this is just giving it some additional data context so we can ground our ai prompts in ai builder with data versus data um, if we need to. So I won't go into the ins and outs of that because I'm sure there'll be further sessions on that as well. So I'll just kind of skip a little bit to, to the end here because um, there's just so much to talk about. So another last thing that I can, a couple things I want to leave you on is when it comes to your data, when you're using Copilot specifically, uh, it doesn't share your data with anyone um, or use it to train the large language models. So Copilot only uses and shares data that you have access to. Um, a thing to watch out for is be careful about some, you know, security by obscurity. So, you know, if you're building your own custom Copilot in Copilot Studio and connecting it to SharePoint, a lot of people might um, hide a SharePoint list but not actually change the permissions and then stuff suddenly showing up, um, you know, that they didn't think that they had access to previously. So that's just, you know, something to be aware of. But if they're, you know, your data is not being used in this case to train any of these models or anything like that. Um, if you want ideas for things, what are things that we can do with these different Microsoft tools? Like, you know, what can I do with AI Builder? What can I do with Power Apps Copilot? We have a prompt library that you can go out to. There's a short link in the bottom left-hand corner there, and it has a bunch of sample prompts that have been tested that you can plug and play and use in here. And if you start using some of these tools, if you complete like you know this training and you find some cool prompts, I would love to see them in this repo, and you can get a cool badge, as you see there, for a Prompt Pro badge. That's a Credly certified badge that you can have and display and on LinkedIn and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, definitely get some ideas from that and you know share your prompts. Uh, just a few resources that I wanted to leave you all with. There's the prompt library. We also have a co-pilot learning hub. So if you just want to go even deeper, um, you know, just to augment this great training that you're getting um, to see more of the co-pilot capability across the Microsoft stack, there's all kinds of video content, tutorial, sample code, everything that you need on that, that one stop shop. 
Um, there's um, prompt overview, you know, so if, um, there's an AI builder prompt guide, which shares some of the stuff that I care for today. So all kinds of great resources, and I'll make sure that you have access to this slide deck as well. So with that, we have a few minutes. Um, I wanted to thank you all and see if there are any questions that we need to cover here in the last few minutes that we have. Yeah, and, and you're free to turn your cameras on if you want to uh, ask a question. Uh, it's okay to put it on the chat area as well. Uh, go for it. Any questions, comments? Yeah, I see a hand raised. All right. Go for it, Mark. Um, you just presented that uh, we can choose between the 3.5 and 4.0 model, and uh, I noticed that too in my Copilot application, uh, but you have to opt in uh, usually. So I'm wondering, is there a reason why 4.0 is not the default? Is there any reason why we would want to go with 3.5 instead of 4? I think, well, for one, 4.0 just came into GA. So for the longest time, it was in preview. So I know that's why it wasn't the default. I don't know. And I think there's also um, like capacity. I think it uses more capacity, the 4.0 model does. So that might be a reason why as well. Um, th those are the main things that come to mind. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Yeah, the, the only comment I would make is, um, I know, April, you, uh, towards the end uh, of the presentation, you geared uh, towards Copilot, which is the focus of this presentation. But everything that, that April spoke about in terms of composing the prompts is useful anywhere that you are playing with generative AI. You know, those insights are very helpful. If you're using ChatGPT or any other tool, this, this is going to help you. Um, I do use... Uh, other tools, um, especially GitHub uh, Copilot, that are more, more going towards uh, code, and, and Scott Durrell is going to present on that later on. And I find it amazing the level of help that we get. Um, so I'm, I'm excited for all Copilots. Uh, maybe GitHub Copilot uh, is is my favorite so far, but we'll we'll see more. But you know, if you need to see this video again. To, to to revise those insights on how to compose your prompts, I'd say that's that's solid gold right there. Yeah, yeah, Not definitely. That I mean, everything that's... else wasn't good, <laughs> but that that part alone helps a lot. I remember, I think I was sitting on a presentation you gave in in Denver, uh, April, and you were talking about this very thing, like prompt engineering, how to compose prompts, and uh, it, it transformed the way I, I use my uh, I use the help of Copilot and AI in general. So. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks. Yeah, and ho hopefully, yeah, if I didn't make it clear, like like you said, that that applies to no matter what what tool you're using, that formula. Um, it, I use it all the time with just chat GPT and different models. So, and then of course, you know, shameless plug for your next session too. So I, I didn't really go into the the depths of Microsoft 365 Copilot, but you'll learn all all more about that in the next session. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> but April, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, all the participants. Thank you very much uh, for being here with us today. I, I failed to show uh, the, the resources available with the course. I, I try to communicate that with email, but I know that a lot of people may not have received or, or read it, but everything in terms of accessing the class is available here in this page. You have the, the link to the session that we are live. You have access to the course material. So as presentation is complete, we're going to make the uh, slide decks available or some parts of it uh, available in this library. You can download an ICS file so that you don't miss the class. It'll give you reminders. And also, we have a smaller group um, in uh, WhatsApp that you can become part of. Uh, we can engage in discussions if people have you know, jobs and internship opportunities, whatever. It, it, this is the place for us to engage and and communicate uh there all right i know that all of north america maybe even central america is going on a daylight saving uh not daylight saving time we are falling back one hour next week so uh classes at the same time if you live in the americas because we are falling back one hour but it may change for people who are living elsewhere so if you live in asia europe i know that you're not going through your time change just yet. So 
download the calendar reminder. I believe it's going to inform you what's the new time for classes from next week forward. And maybe until your time, uh, your clocks change where whatever you leave. Um, thanks again. Uh, I'm super excited for this program. I'm, I'm excited to learn. I learned lots today. This lesson is going live on LinkedIn at 11 p.m. my time or 11 p.m. Eastern, maybe. We'll double check. And then it's going to our YouTube channel. So again, one more time, April, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you soon. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.